Well, good morning, church. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us this first Sunday of May. We are thankful for all that you have done and all that you're doing for our church, all the prayers and support. Um, it's just such a good time to be a church, even though we are virtually distant. One of the things that I heard this week uh, from one of our members was they said that because they're calling more people and talking to them, they feel like we're becoming more and more of a community. And so I just want to encourage you, if you haven't reached out to somebody, give somebody a call in our church. Just take a little bit of your time and just um, get past the niceties that oftentimes happen in church of, well, good morning, hope you're well, good seeing you, we'll see you next week. Now we have the time and the opportunity to take a few minutes to give people a call, to connect with them in a deeper way. And so I just want to encourage you to do that. And I have a few other announcements as well. Um, if you know of people that aren't able to watch our sermons online, that aren't getting our emails, um, then I would encourage you to reach out to me, reach out to the church office and let us know. We can get them hard copies of the words of my sermon. We can um, take them emails. We can do whatever we can to continue to make sure that we are effectively communicating with, with each and every one of our members. And also along those regards, sometimes some of you move or update email addresses or update phone numbers that we don't have. And so if we don't have your current contact information, I have a link on our website now that I would just ask you to go fill out and then ask you for things like your name, phone number, and email address. Um, it's very simple and it goes straight into our digital um, platform. And so it's very simple for you to do and very simple for us to receive. So I would just encourage you to do that as well. And one of the things that I don't know if you do know is that most of our broadcasting right now is going through YouTube, the weekly fireside chats that I'm doing. We're publishing our sermons to YouTube. Well, YouTube has a feature that after you have 100 people that subscribe to the channel, I mean, it unlocks some various features. And we've gone from 20 to 50 over the last couple of weeks. And I just want to encourage you, if you could, take a little bit of time, make a YouTube account and subscribe to our channel. It'll really help us do some things that we can't do technologically at this point. Um, also, if you haven't written on the walls of the new building yet, I encourage you to come down one day after 4.30 or 5, walk through, see what some other people have written, and write some scripture, write a prayer, just write something on the walls and pray over that building as we continue to build it for the glory of God and His kingdom. And I think that's all the announcements that I have for today. That's what I told people. is like, man, we're not doing life as normal, and I still have five announcements for this morning. Um, so it seems kind of crazy, but I am so glad that you are here to join with us today. Um, for our responsive reading, we're going to be doing Psalm 117. But before we do that, let me open us in prayer. Father, I thank you for this time that we have together. I pray that you continue to lead us and guide us as individuals, as a congregation, as a community, as a state, and as a nation during this global pandemic. I pray that in the midst of it all that your joy and peace would surpass all understanding, that we would be filled with your spirit, and that through the worship this morning that we would feel connected to you, to one another in this church, and to other Christians throughout the world. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. And if you would, please join me in the responsive reading at Psalm 117, one of the shortest psalms, the shortest psalm in the Bible. So let us say this together. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol the Lord, all peoples. The Lord's steadfast love towards us is great. The faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let us sing. Our, our opening hymn today is number 75, All People That On Earth Do Dwell, and I promise you will know the melody to this one.
trouble for that. I'll be honest, I wanted to sing Amen at the end of every single verse, because if you couldn't tell, that's the tune to the doxology. Uh, and speaking of doxology, now is the time in our service where we typically give, and I just want to continue to thank you for your generosity and your faithful support for our congregation during this time. I am beyond words and gratitude with the generosity that so many of you have continued to share and give to our church. And I just want to, from the depths of my heart, say thank you. If you want to continue to support us, you can do so online by giving online right now. You can mail in a check to 220 Junction Avenue, or you can swing it by the office when my secretary, Diana, is here from 8 to 12. Um, but during this time of doxology and praise, let us enjoy the special music by Patty McLeod right now.
amen. And if you're standing, you can be seated um, for this time of pastoral prayer. And what I've been doing each of the last several weeks is I have been leading us through prayers of saints throughout the ages, um, through faithful men and women who have led the church and led different people. And so for today's prayer, I'm going to say one of the prayers of St. Augustine. If you don't know who St. Augustine was, he was one of the predominant theological leaders of the church during the first 400 years. It's because of his thought and orthodoxy that we exist as a church today. And so I just wanted to pray some of the words that he prayed um, over 1,500 years ago. So if you would please join us in prayer. And after I say this prayer, we'll go to the Lord's Prayer. And so let's take a moment of silence to still our hearts and then pray together. You are Christ, my Holy Father, my tender God, my great King, my Good Shepherd, my only Master, my best Helper, my most beautiful and my most beloved, my living bread, my priest forever, the leader of our community, my true light, my sweetness, my straight way, my excellent wisdom, my pure simplicity, my peaceful harmony, my entire protection, my good portion, my salvation everlasting. So Jesus Christ, I pray that with my whole life, that we would desire nothing except you. And now, from this time forth, that you would allow all of our desires to grow and to flow out of you, Lord Jesus. That you would hasten where we are going. Where we are seeking. And, oh Jesus, that you would allow us to find you in all places of love or in bitterness. And we pray this, praying the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
would, please join me as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. chapter of Exodus, Exodus 2, 11 to 15. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating Hebrew, one of his own people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck the Egyptian down, and he hit him in the sand. When he went back out the next day, behold, two Hebrews were struggling together, and he said to the man in the wrong, why did you strike your companion? The man answered, Who made you, prince, and judge over us? Do you mean to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, Surely this thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down there by a well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. May be seated and let us pray. Father, I ask that during this time that you would come into this place, no matter where we're at, no matter what we're going through, and that you would open our ears and that you would soften our hearts. And I ask that you allow the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart to be pleasing and acceptable to your Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Before I get to Moses, I want to remind us, the last couple of weeks, I've asked you to look at, to read, to memorize uh, Romans chapter 5, 3 to 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Whether we like to know it or not, we are all on a journey right now. And sometimes in our journey with God, life is good. We go beside still waters and green pastures. And sometimes in our journey, we go through the valley of the shadow of death. And right now, we are all to some extent suffering. Right? Suffering from loss of being able to leave our homes. Suffering from loss of job or loss of income. Suffering from loss of sanity because we're in our house so much with all of our family all day, every day. And don't get me wrong, I love my wife and my kids. But sometimes I just need a little break. This week I went to sit out on the front porch just to have a few minutes by myself. And a couple of minutes later, Emily was out there. And two minutes after that, Sam was out there. And I was like, well, at least I had two minutes. So that was nice. Some of us are suffering because we're sick and we're ill and are, we're dying. We're in this place where we're on this journey and God is still calling us to be faithful to Him. 
And so that's why I wanted to talk about Moses today, because I love the life of Moses and what Moses went through. You know, a lot of times we think Moses, and he was just this great, outstanding leader of Egypt, or of Israel. But in fact, his journey started quite the different. If you look at Exodus, the story of Moses can be found in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, four of the five books of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the main canon of the Jewish faith. And Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, actually does an amazing job of summing up Moses' life for us. So if you don't have the time, which really do you not have the time to read through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy this week, you can at least go back and read through Acts chapter 7 and hear what Stephen had to say about Moses. But Moses' life, it started a little different than most people. You see, Moses lived hundreds of years after Joseph, who we talked about several weeks ago, came into Egypt. And Joseph came in with predominance. He came in as a slave. He raised up to be Pharaoh's right-hand man. And he led Israel there, the people of Israel, so that they could live throughout a devastating time. And we saw how God was with them during that. Well, hundreds of years later, people forgot who Joseph was how God had delivered Egypt through the dreams of Joseph and Pharaoh, and how God was with them. And so Pharaoh, he didn't like these Israelites anymore, and he saw that they were continuing to grow in number and strength and power. And so he said, we just need to oppress these people even more if we made them slaves. And now that they're slaves, they're still continuing to grow and prosper, and that's not good enough. So let's just start killing off all the males. Every baby boy that was born was to be killed. That's just dumbfounding to us now. That's complete genocide. Pharaoh's thought was, well, if there are no baby boys around, then the women will marry Egyptian women. Then they'll be half Egyptian. Then they won't be quite as bad. Then maybe they can assimilate in our population. But no, some faithful women, and I'm sure Moses' mom wasn't the only one, they saw reeds along the Nile. And Moses' mom made a basket out of reeds, put tar in it, and allowed Moses to live. And Moses was... Floating down the river, I can just imagine um, Sam was born nine pounds of three ounces, fat baby boy, and having to put that baby into a basket in water and trusting that God was with him. And his baby Moses is floating and crying down the river. He runs into Pharaoh's daughter who draws him up out of the water. And that's literally what his name means, to be drawn up out of. And he's drawn up out of the water and he starts to go to, um, and Pharaoh's daughter says, I can't let this baby die. She's a decent human being, right? Most decent humans, when they see a helpless baby sitting in the water, they're going to help them out. So Moses's, or so Pharaoh's daughter draws him up out of the water and says, I'm going to raise him as my own. She gets Moses's own mom to be his wet nurse and to come in to, to help nurse him. And, Pharaoh, and Moses, he has the joy and the privilege of being able to be raised in Pharaoh's courts and in Pharaoh's household. Now just imagine this, Pharaoh is the pinnacle of the Egyptian power. He is the end-all, be-all power of that country, and Moses gets the luxury of living in his house. This would be like if we had a permanent president, I guess you could call that a dictator, right? And having somebody born into that household, and they're raised with all the wealth and power and prestige of the nation. And this is exactly what Moses was born into. He was raised in it. And Stephen tells us that he was lived in Pharaoh's house for 40 years. That's longer than I've been alive right now. I'm 37, about to be 38. Man, for 40 years, he knew nothing but wealth and life and abundance and prosperity. And finally, one day, he was out taking a walk, right? Because we take walks now, because that's what we do since we're shut in our houses. He was tired of being in Pharaoh's courts. And he got out and he saw one of his fellow Egyptians beating on one of his fellow Israelites, and he looked around and he's like, hey, nobody's around. I could kill this guy. And Moses murders a man in cold blood. And he thinks he has like a perfect plan. Nobody's around. He puts his body in sand because there's lots of sand in Egypt. It's great to just sink a body down into it. And he's like, ha, I'm feeling pretty good. And he's walking around the next day. That's what's going on here in this text. And he realizes that two Hebrews are fighting themselves. And he's like, guys, come on. We're on the same team. Why are you fighting each other? Egypt is our oppressor, not one another. And the Hebrew people look at him and they're like, what are you going to do about it? Kill us like you did that last guy? And Moses is like, oh, snap, they know. Because you can never really get away with murder, right? 
just for all you people that might be contemplating murdering your spouse because you've been stuck in a house with six weeks with them, you are not going to get away with it. And Moses is out. Pharaoh knows. And what does Moses do? Moses runs. And he flees for his life. And he goes into the wilderness. And he sees these two women who were shepherdesses. And he helps them out. And so what do they do in that day and time? Moses is single on the run. And so Moses' father-in-law is like, hey, I've got these daughters. Why don't you just marry one of them? And Moses becomes a shepherd for 40 more years. So we're talking 40 years in Pharaoh's courts. 40 years as a shepherd wandering around the wilderness. Now, I'm not sure about all of y'all that are 80 in our congregation, but I think most of the people that are, um, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, you're not thinking, hmm, I wonder how this next flock is going to turn out. You're thinking about, man, it's probably going to be time to retire soon, right? And I could just imagine Moses is like, man, I've worked long and hard for my father-in-law. It's time for me to sit back, relax, and enjoy my grandkids. But God had a different plan for him. And so Moses looks up one day and he sees a bush that's on fire. It doesn't burn up. I've seen plants on fire before and they you go. They're gone. And this bush doesn't burn. And Moses is like, well, that's interesting. And so he starts approaching it and he hears this disembodied voice coming from a fire. Now, I'm not sure about you, if I saw a plant that was on fire that wasn't actually burning, and I start walking towards it, and the first thing I hear is, hey, you need to take off your shoes, you're walking on holy ground, I'd be asking what I ate for supper that night before. Like, am I hearing things? Was that mushroom a little bit different mushroom that I didn't plant it on? And Moses has this divine encounter with God. And I love how it goes because Moses is like, God comes to Moses and says, okay, Moses, I am who I am. And Moses is like, you're who? And he's like, I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And this is a huge deal for Moses and for his people. He identifies himself as the God of the patriarchs. The God of the people that had led them and promised them the promised led that led them into Egypt. And now this God, Yahweh, was saying, I'm going to lead you out of it. And Moses is like, and God, and Yahweh speaks to Moses and says, Moses, I want you to lead my people out. And Moses says, no, not me. And Yahweh says, yes, you. And Moses is like, no. And then they kind of have this back and forth. And finally, Moses says, I'm going to allow, I'm going to go. I'm going to be faithful to you, God. I'm going to trust you with this. And so he goes, and he goes into Egypt, and he says, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, no. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine times. Let my people go, no. Let my people go, no. Bad stuff's going to happen. Plagues happen. Over and over again, we see this. And then finally, the Egyptians are catching on. Hey, bad stuff's happening because Israel wants to leave. And the Israelites are catching on. And they're like, hey, Egyptians, um, do you mind if we borrow your um, Blu-ray player, your flat screen TV real fast? We just need it for a couple of nights. They took all their gold and their silver and the plague of the firstborn came, and they plundered Egypt as they fled. And Moses is this great leader, finally, 80 plus years. He's leading the Israelites out of slavery. He leads them to the Red Sea. He has the God leading them, a pillar of fire by night and a cloud by day. He is literally leading each and every step of their way. And Moses becomes this great, amazing leader. Then he leads them through Red Sea, water on one side, water on the other side. God is there. God is mighty. God is great. They get out of the Red Sea, and he makes it to Sinai, and he lives with God's presence for 40 days and 40 nights. Can you imagine that, just talking over and over again, nonstop with God? He receives the law of God for the people of God, and they're supposed to go to the land that God has promised them. So finally, Moses comes down and he says, hey, let's go home, guys. God has given us this land. And the people say no. And instead of going into the promised land, Moses wanders around for 40 more years. The age of 80, isn't that what every 80-year-old wants to do? You're going to be homeless, no security, and you're going to walk every day for 40 years. And this is where I'm not God and where I couldn't be Moses, is because Moses finally, after 40 years, gets to the edge of a promised land, and what happens? He dies. <laughs> this has got to be like the most anticlimactic biblical story that there is. 
Moses, this great leader, Moses who was leading God's people, Moses who provided for God's people, Moses who listened to God's people, his character had been transformed, right? He had endured lots of things. He had persevered. He had hope in his heart. And he didn't get to go to the promised land. What? You're kidding me. But I think that's exactly what happens. That sometimes we don't make it to the promised land. And in this story, I've got to love the way that Israelites react. Moses, this great leader who has been transformed and formed and is being led by God. And what do the Israelites do the whole time? The Israelites, day number two out of Egypt, they're like, sweet, it's a party, we're out of Egypt, we're finally free. They turn around and they see that Egypt is following them and they're like, oh snap, they're going to kill us. Moses, did you lead us out for two days just so that we could die in the desert? The Red Sea's right here. We're never going to get across it. We don't care about the plagues. We already forgot about that here. And now, God, what are you going to do? And Moses parts the Red Sea, and they're like, oh, that's kind of cool. We're walking through a sea on dry ground. Water over here, water over there. It's so good. And they get out of the Dead Sea in 48 hours. They're like, Moses, we're thirsty. Come on. We went through the Red Sea so that now we could be um, thirst, die of thirst? You've got to be kidding me. And so Moses and God provide them water. And then they're like, oh, we're thankful for the water. No, then they're like, come on, we're thirsty now. They can't believe. They're thirsty. They, they're hungry. They don't have any food. And so God provides them manna every day. And do they trust that God's going to provide it day after day for them? No. They take too much and it spoils and they're like, ah. Oh. And then day after day and week after week they have manna and they're like, God, where's the, the beef at? Right? And God's like, it's at Wendy's, of course. Y'all don't remember that commercial from the 80s? <laughs> so, where's the meat? And God provides them quail from heaven. And they're wandering around and they finally make it to Sinai and Moses is having that mountaintop experience that I talked about. And man, lo and behold, what are the people doing? They're like, well, where's Moses at? It's been like two weeks since we saw him. Is he really still alive? Nope. I think we need a new God and a new leader. So let's take all that gold that we wanted from the Egyptians. Let's make them a golden calf. And let's make Aaron our leader because Aaron's probably a better leader than Moses is. Can I get an amen, people? And Moses comes down and throws the stones down and people are destroyed and the might and power of God is there. And then he's like, okay guys, now it's time to go to the promised land and he sends out the spies and 10 of the 12 spies, they come back and they're not God is faithful, God is good. God has led us from Egypt through the Red Sea, provided water from nowhere, provided manna from nowhere, provided quail from nowhere, has spoken to our leader and now we're going to go victoriously to the promised land. Now, they're like, um, those are some pretty tall guys over there with some pretty thick walls. We're not going to be able to make it in. And because of that, they wander around the desert for 40 years. I swear it's like Moses is the best dad with the worst kids on a car trip. Like, as soon as they leave the house, they're like, Dad, are we really going there? We don't want to go there. Those people, home is so much more comfortable than Disneyland. I don't want to go to Disney. It's going to be awful there. Dad, I'm thirsty. Dad, I'm hungry. Dad, i got to go to the bathroom. Dad, where are you? And Moses is stuck with these crying babies of people. And we would never act like that, right, church? No, we're so much holier and so much better than they are. And then finally, Moses pulls with all of his kids up to the gates of Disneyland. And he says, y'all have fun. I'm going to die now. Come on. That in Acts, the fact that Acts ends at 28 and doesn't have like 29, so we don't have any resolution to what happens in Paul's lives, are to me the most disappointing ends of people's lives in the Bible. If anybody deserved the promised land, it was Moses. And what it shows us is that Moses' life and Moses' journey contradicts what many of us believe about our faith in God right now. Because all this, a lot of times what we hear are things like, well, if you just trust in God, he's going to give you what you want. If you trust in God, your life's going to be happy, and he's just going to give you abundant blessing after blessing. And if you just send me 1995 right now, God will bless your life. And as Christians, we expect to have this sort of blessed life where life is just good and God and everything is happy. 
And man, we have lived in a country where our lives have been good, and we have been happy, and we have had abundance. But now we're like Moses looking at the promise, and I'm like, we're not going to get back there. You know, are we? What's going to happen? Moses' journey reminds us that it doesn't always end well for the people of God. Reminds me of a hike that Sam and I took last Saturday. Um, we had gotten out our maps of Lincoln County's hikes and decided that we were going to hike from Ski Apache down to the Lower Bonita River um, through Monju Peak. It was going to be about 11 to 12 miles, and we thought this was going to be, man, it's such a great day for a hike. It was in the 70s. Um, it was lovely, beautiful weather as it's been up here in the mountains. And so we hand off a mile and a half into the hike, and things are good. We take a little break, take a little snack. And we get to this place, and we've done a little bit of this trail before, and it gets to the north face of the mountain which still had a little bit of snow on it. And that's no big deal. We'd already walked through a little bit of snow that morning. And so uh, we know that it's a big patch of snow. We can't tell how much snow there is. And so we start walking, and it's, you know, two inches, four inches deep, and my feet are stepping in and, go and crashing the snow a little bit. And I look at Sam, and I'm like, uh, do you want to keep going? And he's like, yeah, of course, Dad. And I'm kind of like, well, I don't know about this, Sam, because you can't see the trail, can't see a path, and you can't see the end of where the snow stops. But, you know, Sam is all gung-ho to do it and to finish this hike and to go the 12 miles and to get it done. And I'm just like, well, I don't want to disappoint my 11-year-old son, so I'm going to start walking. And we start walking, and the snow starts getting deeper and deeper. And what uh, becomes eventually over half a mile in the snow that has drifts that are over 40 inches deep because I'm sinking up into the snow waist deep at some points crawling out of the snow saying, Jesus, help me, because I have no other words at this point. My pulse is breaking, and I'm just like, God, are you kidding me? I don't know if I'm lost. I don't know where we're at. I don't know what's going on, but I just need you to help me. And lo and behold, with the occasional cut tree that we could see, when we got out of the snow over half a, um, a mile of trail later, almost 45 minutes to an hour of transversing through the steps of snow, we end up exactly on the trailhead that we left off of. It was dumbfounded. And then we walk through this path, and we're on this beautiful grassy hill, and on that hill, it's just like the snow. You can only see a little bit of the path in front of us. You see, a lot of times in our journeys with God, what we want to know is that I want to know that, hey, I'm starting off at Ski Apache, and I'm going to end at Lower Bonita River, and I need to know that I'm going to get there plain and simple, no problems. But a lot of times what happens is we have this trail that's completely covered with snow, completely covered with grass, and we have no idea how we're going to get there, how we're going to get out, and the only thing we can say is, okay, God, help me now. And I've talked a lot about our prayer life and how God has a different, there are two different basic sorts of prayers, a help me prayer and a have me prayer. And I've urged you, church, to start having have me prayers. God, have me here, have me now, allow my life to be fully surrendered to you. But man, sometimes in the midst of crisis, in the midst of the journey, the only prayer that we can say is, Lord, help me. I said three little words on that trail, Jesus help me, and it was funny, I said it subconsciously, I wasn't even aware I was saying it, and when we got into the car at Manju Peak, because we didn't finish the journey, because our socks were wet, blisters were already on my feet, Sam said, Daddy, you're right, we prayed to Jesus, and he helped us get it out. That's, I think, a lesson that we learned from this journey from the journey of Murray, Moses, from my journey on the trail. None of us are sure how long this global pandemic is going to last. As much as the experts and the states and the governors want to say, man, it's just another two more weeks or another month or another whatever, none of us are sure. We don't know if or when things are going to return to normal. We don't have an anticipated start date for people to come to this place to worship again. Sam and I were driving around, and he asked, he said, Daddy, is the building going to be finished before people can worship in it? Like, are we just going to have an empty new sanctuary sitting there? And I was like, I don't know, Sam. We're in the midst of this journey, and sometimes the trail is easy, and sometimes we're waist deep in snow, crawling out of it, saying, Jesus, help us. Sometimes we're stuck with whiny people in the backseat that just complain about every single step of the way, and I realize that we're not the only ones going through it right now. 
But what we can rest assured is that no matter the, the junk that we're going through right now, that following God makes our lives better. As the psalmist says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Better is one day in the presence of God. Better is one day living your life for God than spending a thousand days anywhere else. And so even though right now many of us are deep, uh, waist deep in snow, many of us are lost with people that are complaining and crying about our lives right now, God is with you. And God longs to lead you each and every step of the way. And so I think those are simple lessons that we can learn from Moses. As one is that in the midst of this time, we need to have faith. We need to trust that God is with you. That God is with us as a congregation. God is with his global church. And God is with his creation. We need to believe and hope and trust that God is here. And that as we're crying out waist deep, Jesus help me that he will help you. How does he do this? He gives us faith. He increases our faith by fellowshipping with other Christians, by reading stories of the faith from other believers, from the Bible, and through seeking God through meditation and prayer. But I think as he increases our faith, something that God wants to give us during this time is peace and is joy. You see, the whole time that I was waist deep in snow, I knew that um, even though my toes were starting to tingle at parts of it, that as soon as I escaped the snow, and as soon as Sam escaped the snow, we would have a story to tell the rest of our lives because by God, we made it. And that gave me joy in the midst of the storm. And doesn't Jesus tell us in John 16 that he has come to overcome the world and to give us peace? says, just as I have suffered, you too can trust that you're going to suffer. And because of that, I want you to know I'm giving you peace. And what more do we need in this world right now than the peace of Christ in our hearts and the joy of Christ in our midst? And that is my hope and my prayer. That's something I think that we see over and over again through Moses' life and Moses' journey is Moses never gives up. Moses never loses faith. Moses never says, well, he does say a couple of times, God, I'm done with these people. But then he has, you know, a little change of heart. But Moses finishes with peace and with joy. And what I didn't talk about with Moses' life is how Moses ended his life. After forgive me, my Bible fell earlier. You know, Moses ends right before he makes it to the promised land. With the kid full of cars that were complaining about going to Disney in the first place, Moses dies in the parking lot before he gets there, literally looking across into it. And with his final breath and with his final words, does he curse God because he didn't make it to the promised land? No. Does he go to the Israelites and say, hey guys, y'all were the worst road trip companions ever? No. Listen to what he does. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, at the end of the story, he blesses each and every single tribe. He goes through them tribe by tribe, all 12 of them, and says, this is your blessing. And then he ends up in, Exodus, or in Deuteronomy 33, 29, and he says, blessed are you, O Israel, who is like you, a people saved of the Lord, the shield of your help, the sword of your triumph. He's saying God has been with you. God has blessed you. God has led you. And you are blessed because of that. Then his last words are unbelievable. Your enemies shall come on to you. And you shall tread upon your backs. He's like the journey's not done. There's still battles before you. But God is with you and you can do it. Instead of a curse, he leaves a blessing. And I think that's what God is calling us to do in the midst of this time, is to not only be a people of peace and joy, but to leave blessing where people are cursing. It's so easy to get caught up in the he said, she said, this happens, what happens, what happens. But what Moses does is he doesn't look back to his life and said, man, those last 40 years are horrible. He says, we're almost there, guys, and you can do it. 
I'm going to bless you. So how can we as a church use our words when people are cursing us, cursing our leaders, cursing our government, and turn those into blessings? As it says in another part of the Pentateuch, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. As Jesus says, what good is it if you repay blessings for blessings instead of blessings for curses? Because even the heathens can do that. So church, let us be a people that speak blessing in the people's lives this week. Because God is with us. God is leading us. He is giving us his joy and his peace right here, right now. And he wants us to be a people to bless this creation. Let us pray. Father, I thank you so much for the life of your faithful servant, Moses. For how after 80 years he didn't stop, but he was still faithful to the call that you placed upon his life. And how after 40 years of listening to people complain and gripe about the journey that they are on, that he did not give up, that he did not lose the faith, but that he continued and continued not only, but he finished the faith with peace, with joy, and with blessing. So Holy Spirit, give us your fruit, give us peace and joy. And help us to be a people that bless others, now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Our closing hymn today is number 399 in the hymn book, Take My Life and Let It Be.
The Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you. May his countenance be upon you. May his grace and peace give you great joy during this time of our lives. And may you be filled with this Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. <laughs>